access level has recently increased. Excellent. Incoming message. Welcome, agents, to episode 100 of Behind the Scanner. Our very special guest tonight is Ingrid's creator and Niantic CEO, John Hankey. Welcome to the show. Join us during the broadcast in our live chat room on our website, BehindTheScanner.com. Subscribe to our channel and watch previous recordings on YouTube. For all the latest updates and news, follow us on Google Plus and Facebook. And now, your hosts of Behind the Scanner. Holy cow, did Kelly really say episode 100? Um, I have to admit, um, it's a pretty overwhelming number and accomplishment that um, we're facing here. So those of you who are tuning in for the first time, I'm Daphne. Agent Ms. Parker from Washington, D.C., and before the other hosts introduce themselves, um, I just want to share a little bit of my awe and amazement um, that we've reached this far and for so long. When Andrew Krug and I first started chatting about the idea for this show, gosh, well over two years ago, um, I didn't think either of us had any idea that we'd last this long and let alone a lot of the experiences that we've gotten to learn about and all the people we've gotten to meet through the show globally and worldwide and and, and the team that I have been very blessed and honored to get to work with. Um, you've gotten to meet Kelly and Jorge and Frank and Shannon a little bit but there are a lot of people here behind the scenes that uh, do a lot of work for us and uh, Jesse and Shannon and Lisa Spangenberger, um, I cannot thank you all enough. This would not be happening without you. Um, of course, also, this show could not be happening without the great guests that uh, we have here. And tonight, um, I'm really excited to be able to uh, get to chat with the person who's literally brought us all together uh, not just with the show, but the game that we all love, and John Hankey, and I look forward to going forward. But before that, um, I think our co-creator, Andrew Krug, would also like to share a few things. Yeah, I just want to say thank you guys for joining us tonight. This is episode 100, and for us, it's a huge milestone. We kind of just did the show because we we're passionate about the game, we we're passionate about your stories. Um, we started making friends literally all around the world. I flew into Germany and instantly hooked up with somebody who took me on a tour of their city. And all of that was possible because of Ingress. You know, I say it time and time again, and it does lose its potency, that Ingress is something that breaks down barriers. It doesn't matter what your socioeconomic status is, your race, religion, your politics, anything. You know, people identify on a common goal that is based around getting together and being green or blue <laughs> is what it boils down to. And so we've made a lot of fast friendships. Uh, Daphne is one of my closest friends. I would never have met her if it wasn't for the game. You know, I performed the marriage ceremony of a guy that I met during the game. I mean, it, it, that just doesn't happen, you know, by playing Call of Duty. So, you know, there's something innate in Ingress that facilitates this sort of meta experience that everybody loves. And that's what we want to explore with Behind the Scanner. I mean, episode 100, barely taking you know a week off, except for maybe when we go to anomalies. Uh, this is quite the milestone. So, thank you everybody for tuning in week after week. We really appreciate it. We appreciate all your support. You know, this being a live show, there's been some technical difficulties every now and then, but you know, we power through it and you stay with us. So, thank you very much. And as we were talking about technical difficulties, I need to unmute myself. Um, so as you no doubt know, um, like we said, it's a very special evening. Um, in addition, we've got Typhoon Jim from Operation Essex to share a few updates to the investigation. Uh, for those of you who are able to join the chat room, Jesse Spangenberger is in there. And I, you can join that uh, at, hold on, it's 
Ruger77, R-U-G-G-A-R-77, dot wix, dot com, slash behind the scanner, and you can click on the chat room like always. You can also click on the link at G+, or also on Facebook. So without further ado, um, we've also we've got Kelly and Jorge who are co-hosting, and welcome to John Hankey. Welcome, John. Unmute yourself. <laughs> hey, guys. Um, can I say something now? Please do. Oh, yes, of sure. course. Please do. Hey, I just want to congratulate you guys on hitting 100 episodes. I am a huge fan of this show, and it's been wonderful watching you guys over the past, I don't know, is it a year? Almost two years. Um, it's fantastic. I think you guys represent the best of Ingress. You have brought faces and real names to people that I've heard about and read about and operations that I've heard about. It's been awesome to see them come to life on your show and to learn a little bit more about the people behind those agent names, so congrats. I love it. Um, I remember, actually, Kelly's Hangout, which I think preceded Behind the Scanner, and I tried to join it once uh, from my cell phone when I was commuting home. Um, but that was kind of that was a really special early moment for me in the game to see that starting to happen, and then you guys took that concept with BTS and turned it into a real show, and now it's like real professional and everything. So congrats! Thank you. Yeah, I do remember that um, you joined us, and it was this beautiful, sunny, you know, California day, and um, some of the other participants in this video chat that would host every week, um, some of them didn't recognize you. And so I do remember we had a participant from Kansas City who just started going off on, well, this is wrong with Ingress, and why is this happening? And she had no idea who you were. <laughs> but I, I think that really speaks a lot that, you know, you guys are always listening to feedback and always, you know, open to new ideas. So that's, that's always been something that's really, you know, stood out about, about Niantic. Cool. So, yeah, that's awesome. <clears throat> yeah. Lots of fun. Should we dive right into it? Yeah, let's get to some questions. Right. So, be careful. That's my boss sitting over there. He's literally <laughs> like right there. So. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's see here. Who's gonna go first? I'll I, I'll be Tinder crew. So, okay. uh, well, John, I I'm honored to be the first one opening this interview. So I want to ask you: Are you playing Pokemon Go yet? And if so, which team you are on? Uh oh, he's muted. Uh, on mute. Got it. There. Uh, yeah, of course I'm playing Pokemon Go. I've been playing it and testing it for quite a while while we've been developing the game. Uh, I am a dedicated Team Yellow uh, member. And I am earning my stripes. But uh, actually, since we went to production, my account got wiped. So I'm starting from zero, just like everybody else. And I have not had a ton of time to go out and play for the past couple of days, because we've been rather busy with stuff, getting the game launched. Well, Team Yellow is also my team. So I think there's a, that's good. good oh, come good, good, good on. Instinct. Now we're separated, because I'm red. Red, red, <laughs> red, red. Red as well. Woo! Woohoo! Represent. Nobody's team blue. Or hey. <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't have my Pokemon Go account. Oh, sorry. Not uh -oh. today. Maybe oh. tomorrow. Yeah, soon, I soon. I kind of have that time to to put it on. I'm I'm sure you'll pick blue though when it when it comes out. All right. First question. Let's Jorge. keep moving on. Yeah. yeah. Got that so, taken care of. <laughs> um, elephants out of the room now. Okay, so well, I'm going to ask on behalf of Typhoon Jim, who will be on later on this evening. Um, you've now been present at what might be might call the first steps of two genres of games: uh, the MMO and the augmented reality geolocation game. What lessons do you think you look you took forward from Meridian Fifty Nine in the founding of Niantic? and the creation of Ingress? Yeah, interesting question. 
First of all, when you introduced me earlier in the show, you called me the creator of Ingress. And I just want to clarify something. There's a whole amazing team of people that create the game, and so I cannot take credit as the being the sole creator of Ingress, but I am very happy to have played a part in that. Um, yeah, I did have a chance to work on one of the very first 3D MMOs called Murdy 59 back in the 1990s, which sounds like a really long time ago now. Um, and I think you could say that is a direct... Uh, precursor to um, Ingress. Uh, I mean, certainly the experience of standing that product up and seeing how people reacted to it uh, was a ins huge inspiration for um, the design of Ingress. And the key aspect of it that shocked us all way back then um, and kind of resurfaced in a different way with Ingress was the social aspect of the game. Um, the very first time that I saw the early version of Meridian 59, uh, there was this moment where another avatar walked up in the game to me, and uh, you could change your facial expressions in the game so you could smile and frown. So this avatar walked up to me and smiled and then waved. We had these kind of crude animations. But it was a huge thing to realize at that point that there's another human being behind that avatar. And it was so different than you know any other video game experience for that reason. And that, of course, with MMOs, turned into a huge thing with people forming uh, guilds, um, which uh, you know really became the backbone of that whole genre of games. And you know went on, and uh, you know in terms of um, Sony's EverQuest and World of Warcraft and so on to become this big thing, and drove a lot of the interaction. And I'm sure it was the main reason that people kept playing those games, you know, year after year. So. Whenever we were, you know, thinking about Ingress very early on, it was definitely the inspiration was to take the concept of an MMO and to take that great teamwork and social play dynamic of traditional online MMOs, but bring that into the real world. And um, but as you all know, that all it completely changes whenever it's not an avatar walking up to you and smiling with a fake avatar smile and waving with a canned animation, but it's a real you know, honest to goodness, living, breathing human being that's in front of you, and with all of their depth and all of the aspects of their personality, and you meet people, and all of a sudden you're friends with people, and you talk to people online, and then you see them at a few events, and we all have seen where that can lead, you know, to really great, lasting, amazing friendships like you guys have amongst yourselves here. Dating, of course, happens somewhat unexpectedly. Romances, I guess that will happen. You put people together. Um, and then the Ingress Babies, you know, was kind of the final culmination of that, I guess. I don't know. Maybe there will be Ingress Grandbabies, I hope. Um, but that was a huge moment of joy for me whenever, you know, you see the pictures of couples and friends, but then when we saw the babies and these relationships, you know, were kind of permanent in that sense. Um, it was great to see that. But yeah, I think you can trace a lot of that back to the early experiment experience and and stuff with the um, yeah, with the online MMOs. Yeah, thanks for clarifying with that. And yes, absolutely, as a beneficiary in my so expansive social circle now, um, I'm very grateful to you and your great team. Uh, next question is so what fears did you have back in 2011 and 2012 when setting this all up? And at what point did you realize you had made it in terms of the gaming world? Yeah, I distinctly remember the night we launched the game. Um, I mean, we had been working on it for you know over a year in advance of that and had been beta testing it inside of Google. Um, but it's one thing to kind of show something to your friends and colleagues, and it's another thing to sort of expose it to the big, wide world and to be vulnerable to how people are going to react to it, whether people are going to embrace it and like it or run away from it, you know, covering their eyes. So we didn't really know how it was going to go. Um, and I was, you know, I really had butterflies. I had no idea how people were going to react to the game. Um, there was definitely a huge risk for us at Google to put out something that was so different. I mean, it was cloaked in all that is Ingress and the lore of Ingress, uh, very unlike any other Google product that um, was out there. And 
I don't know. I felt like it was a big risk, and I was definitely scared in terms of whether it would fall flat on his face or whether people would embrace it. And uh, we watched, I watched, and it was great to see the first set of feedback coming back from real users and online media and as people you know, perceived the strong points of the game, as flawed as it was in its early days. Um, you know, people, uh, many people embraced that aspect of going outside and exploring and, you know, taking a game out into the real world. So that, the seeds, they're still with us today and Inspire Pokemon Go were there. Um, but yeah, it was terrifying to watch the game, to be honest. But I'm glad we did. And so, um, sort of reversing back into time, um, a lot of people maybe don't know that you started a company called Keyhole. And I was wondering, you know, how were you inspired to start um, some of your earlier companies? And, um, you know, what would you say were, are the keys to success with startups? That's a good question. I don't know if there's any, like, magic keys to success. I, um, I've tried to always just kind of follow my heart in terms of pursuing things that I find personally interesting. Um, I kind of developed this notion about certain things kind of deserving to exist in the world and certain things maybe not, and, and I've kind of used that as a filter. And I guess by that I mean that, <clears throat> you know, things that are genuinely adding value to people that are doing something unique and different, um, that are really, you know, bringing something new to the table and bringing something, you know, useful and valuable to users, those are the kinds of things that deserve to exist. And if you can find things like that and build businesses around them, build companies around them, they'll be successful. And if you're trying to take something that really doesn't have a good reason to exist in the world, that, you know, if it's meeting a need that's served by other, you know, things that are out there, other products and solutions, and you're trying to take that and force it into the market, or you're trying to come up with something to fill some perceived economic opportunity where you think people are willing to spend money for something, so you're trying to come up with something to fill that, you know, I think that's the wrong way to do it. Um, I don't know if it works every time, but um, my philosophy was that if I'm spending my time and energy working on something that I really feel, you know, adds real value to the world, that really deserves to exist and is going to benefit people, whether that succeeds as a business or not, in the end of the day, I won't feel like I wasted my time. You know, I feel like I've tried to make something that's worth making and I've taken the best shot at it. So that's the way I always rationalized it, you know, and the from time to time, you know, during the dark hours when it wasn't clear if something was gonna make it or be successful or not, I you know, just always told myself that it was it was a good thing, it deserved to be out there and that it would, you know, it was a good use of my time and energy to, to try to realize that. And uh, certainly there are times with Keyhole, which was the technology that was uh, behind a product called the Keyhole Earth Viewer, which was acquired by Google back in 2004 and ultimately turned into Google Earth. You know, that product was started at the very end of the first dot-com boom, and we survived the dot-com bust, which was a pretty bleak time out here in Silicon Valley. Tons of companies went bankrupt. There were lots and lots of empty office buildings, lots of people losing their jobs. And we just kind of barely made it through that period uh, with a lot of hard work and sweat and good luck. Um, so there were definitely, you know, there were dark times there when it wasn't clear if we were going to have jobs in a couple of weeks, if we were going to have a way to support ourselves, support our families. Uh, but we kept at it, and at the end of the day, we built something really cool, and it's used now by lots and lots of people, and I think has done a lot of good in the world. So, um, yeah, I just feel very lucky that it worked out the way it did. Yeah, it's definitely something that's brought, I think, in my opinion, good to the world. You know, we got we talked about relationships and babies and everything, but uh, this, so to say that you've got your finger on the pulse of technology, I think, is a bit of an understatement. You know, you get invited to speak at PAX and things of that nature. What, is, in your opinion, in your mind, is sort of the next big thing in tech? Yeah, there are a lot of people spending a lot of money trying to figure that out. <laughs> um, again, I mean, I don't know that I would uh, be presumptuous enough to say that I know what is going to be the next big thing in tech. I can just speak about things that I find interesting in technology, I guess. Um, and there's a lot out there that I think is really interesting, uh, some of which I'm involved in and some of which I'm not. Stuff that I'm not involved in that I think is super interesting is uh, changing transportation. Uh, and that relates to self-driving cars and self-driving buses and 
uh, electric vehicles and so on. I really feel like I'm excited about that, not just because of the technology that it's pretty amazing that you can build a car to drive itself, but the opportunity there is really transforming how people live and transforming how cities are constructed, how people live together, what those cities look like, what people's lives look like on a, a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I'm a big fan of cities. I'm a big fan of walking and biking, um, as I've talked about before, some of you guys may know. So, um, you know, the opportunity to, to change cities so that they're more friendly to pedestrians and bicycles and to have uh, autonomous vehicles, you know, kind of filling that public transportation void that exists in a lot of places and gives people a connection so that you can walk and bike and then hop on, you know, some type of transportation that takes care of the longer trips. I'm super excited by that vision, you know. Um, I love being liberated from a car. Uh, you know, I try to, you know, for every city I go to, I try to explore the public transportation, figure out how to use it because I just think it's fun. It just feels like you're kind of surfing through the world whenever you are kind of car free and you can be kind of carefree and hop on buses and trains and get from one place to another and um, it's pretty awesome. So I think there's a big transformation happening in transportation and it's going to have a huge impact on the way people live, a hugely positive one I think. Um, Closer to home, I am, you know, there's virtual reality and augmented reality and I've gone on the record as saying virtual reality, I'm sure will be super compelling for a lot of people. Uh, I've used, you know, I've used the Sony VR rig, which I have to say I was very impressed by in terms of the quality of that experience. I did the Shark Tank demo where a great white shark's trying to eat you in virtual reality and it's genuinely, genuinely scary. It really gets you at a gut level. Um, but I don't know that it really adds that much to the world. I mean, to me, it feels like a big screen TV and THX sound or something. I mean, it's a great way to have an immersive entertainment experience, but I, I'm not fully convinced that it makes the world better in a fundamental way. So I, I mean, plenty of people are interested in exploring it and are putting money into it. So it will be what it will be without, uh, you know, my involvement one way or the other. But I am very excited on the other hand about augmented reality. Uh, and that means a lot of different things to a lot of to different people, but uh, for me it's those sets of technologies which can enhance the things that we do when we're out of the house and moving around, if we're walking or biking or talking to people in real life, visiting real stores. Um, it is the evolution of the cell phone today which is with us all the time and you know we use to talk to people, we use to play games, we use to buy things. Um, it's literally a tool that just makes so much of what we do easier and I think that functionality will evolve into some kind of augmented reality where instead of carrying a brick around in our hands, it will be something that's a little more elegant in terms of the interface with, uh, you know, human input and output devices. So um, glasses, watches, earphones, earbuds, um, you know, I think we'll see an evolution of the tech and the operating systems uh, and the hardware so that, uh, you know, these the, those experiences are all richer, made richer and more interesting through um, AR tech. And I do think we'll ultimately get to the Google Glasses 4.0, you know, the AR goggles that you wear, um, where magical things, you know, appear in front of your eyes. But I think we're probably a few years away from that. But yeah, those are those are some of the things I'm interested in. Well, um, talking about the magical things and, and the next big thing, Ingers was that, for, at least for most of all. So this starts in Google. What uh, were your thoughts when Niantic was a spun off from Google? Well, you know, I loved my time at Google. I spent 10 years at Google, uh, and it's the best company I've ever worked for. I think it's maybe the best company in the world to work for. Uh, it is an amazing place uh, because they treat people really well. They're famous for treating people well, but also I think mainly because they've attracted just such an amazing set of people. So you can walk around and the people you meet there, it's mind-blowing. And I remember talking to Ray Kurzweil who's, you know, wrote the book about the singularity. I mean, how many places can you work where you bump into that person at a corporate function and you can talk about the future of human intelligence and machines? <laughs> um, but we were doing something kind of unique with, you know, Ingress and Niantic, and uh, 
it wasn't exactly aligned with a lot of what Google was doing. So it really felt like it would be more natural to do it as an independent company with that structure, with Google as a shareholder, but with us being independent. And so we were very excited to realize that uh, opportunity. And uh, once we began looking into that and exploring how that could work, uh, we found a very um, willing partner in the Pokemon company and Nintendo, you know, groups that we had already been working with on the early stage of Pokemon Go. And the idea that they could be co-owners of the company uh, meant that we could have a much deeper partnership than we otherwise would have, and we could collaborate in a much closer way. Uh, so, yeah, that was everything just kind of lined up. And then once we exited from Google, I found it, as much as I loved Google, I found it incredibly energizing to be back in a true startup environment. And I, I'm going to walk around and I, I'll just show you guys a couple of things in the office in a, in a minute if we have time. But um, it's just different being in a startup. I mean, everybody is just that much more committed and that much more energized to make it happen. So we just have a great vibe here. I think um, just amazing people that enjoy working with one another. And uh, so it's it's been good. We're having a lot of fun being our own thing. I know that feeling about uh, enjoying the people you work with. Um, before I ask my next question, um, just want a little bit of housekeeping for those who are watching. Uh, we had mentioned the chat room where you can chat with us live, uh, especially Jesse Spangenberger, who's been a valued uh, team member for quite some time. Uh, he's hosting the chat room. Um, we have, uh, you can just join easily at behindthescanner.com and at the top, just click on chat and you can join the room. All right, John. So, what? Was there an event or something specific that happened that caused you to realize how much of a big hit Ingress had become? Um, I mean, the thing, it was not one event. It was many events. And it was, it, they were the events that turned into our anomalies. To me, whenever we first started seeing people interested and willing to come together in real life uh, to connect, about the game, through the game, to play the game, to hang out together. Um, that was the moment, it answered a fundamental question that we had. And that fundamental question is depicted in our promotional video for Ingress. The moment is when the woman and the man walk up to the portal and they're both playing Ingress and they look at one another and I think one of them raises an eyebrow at the other one. In, in the video we just left that moment hanging, like what happens next? And we knew that that would probably happen. Like people would come across other people playing the game in the real world, but we had no idea what would happen after that moment. Whenever uh, people who didn't know each other kind of cross paths in the real world, and um, our kind of backup plan was that people would enjoy playing the game with people they knew from the office or from school. Like you would get your friends together and people you already knew, and you would say, "Oh, let's let's play this game together." Um, we just had no idea if, if people would run away in terror or if they, you know, if that would be a kind of icebreaker and people would eventually start interacting with one another. So we did the first meetup slash event slash anomaly. Um, I shouldn't say we did, but it occurred, right, in Cahokia Mountains. And uh, Joe Philly was there. Joe Philly, who I actually, I don't know if you guys can see Joe back there. Oh. I have his poster here signed by lots and lots of Ingress agents. But Joe went out. He volunteered. He's like, well, I'll go. And uh, he jumped on a plane and flew out. And uh, I mean, you guys, those of you that have been around Ingress know the story. I mean, it was cold. It was, um, I think, January, the last day in January. And outside of St. Louis, Missouri, it was sleet and rain. And all these people came, um, all these people. I mean, there were 50, 60 people who came and stayed and uh, played all day, uh, taking shelter from the rain where they could. And then the real kicker was that night, Joe posted the pictures on social of everybody going out for dinner afterwards and you know having a, this big kind of raucous you know meal and having drinks and stuff together. And it was just, it was amazing. I mean, it was just, it was wild to see that and that um, it was. There was potential there, and so, you know, we thought about helping other events like that happen. Um, 
I think Bowstring was the next one that we did, and then it rolled into that summer where we had um, Time Zero in London and Minotaur in Minneapolis and the uh, Cassandra events in New York and Washington and and so on. And uh, each one of them was kind of bigger than the last one. Daphne, I met you in Washington and that Cassandra during that first summer, I remember, and Andrew, actually. And uh, that was just such a fantastic experience of seeing people having fun playing the game and coming together and doing stuff that we never, ever expected. Like, I distinctly remember talking to you at the after party, and you were holding your battle plan, Operation Hulk Smash. And uh, you showed it to me, and I couldn't believe it, because you explained, like, okay, some guys in Russia made this plan, and, like, every portal across the city of Washington, D.C. was that was in the zone was detailed out, and there were... You know, people were assigned to each cluster throughout the course of the day, and I was sh utterly shocked that people would go to that much work to design a, you know, battle plan, for lack of a better word, for the game. And that was my first thought. My second thought was, like, what are the guys at the NSA thinking, you know, to, for these people chattering about, you know, some Russian who's chattering about, you know, this, all these key locations in Washington and times and assignments of squads and attacks and... Um, I was like, oh, they're going to swoop in and arrest everybody any moment now. But, uh, yeah, it was just a, it was a great upward trajectory of each, um, each event kind of being more amazing than the last. And to be honest, that's still going on. I think the event in San Diego two weekends ago was one of the best ones I've ever been to. Um, and I'm headed to Tokyo on Sunday to, get, to be out there for the event on Saturday, which will be our biggest event ever. It should be in the vicinity of 10,000 people. Uh, so I don't know. I'm just eyes wide open to see what happens next. It just keeps getting more interesting. Yeah, those those early days of ingress were, were kind of fun. I remember in DC we did a uh, a portal hunt, and we had to be careful because we put QR codes on places, maybe on a few public buildings, perhaps you know a courthouse or two. And oh, they blended we, just fine. Yeah, it, it did work out just fine. The Secret Service weren't too too worried about things, although the White House portal. Did, did, did disappear the night after, I guess. So, um, a lot of good times. But, speaking of that, all these cool locations, you know, Ingress, obviously, is a geolocation-based game, and with that, you know, there are some folks that, uh, to play, will falsify their location. How, what has that been like to deal with? So now the tough questions begin. Um, well, I mean, I'll be honest. When we initially launched the game, we uh, vastly underestimated the energy and effort that people would put into attempting to um, play the game um, in that way. And it took us a while to catch up to that, and we kind of caught up for a while, and then we took our eye off the ball, and people kind of got out in front of us again. And we're just now coming off of a wave of putting a lot of effort and energy into a significantly more robust infrastructure to keep the game fair uh, and fun for everybody. And it's been a rough ride. Um, you know, there, there are people out there that have been very involved in Ingress and very committed, but also uh, in some cases using um, cheating applications too. And so it's, it's, it's been tough. I think it's been tough for the community. Um, but for the game to be fun and for it to be meaningful to us, uh, it has to have some rules that basically enforce, um, you know, the notion that you have to be at the location that you're claiming to be at to play. I mean, that's the thing that inspires us and drives us to get out of the house and go down the street that we wouldn't have gone down to before, go to the town we wouldn't have gone down to before, go to the state or the country we wouldn't have gone to before. So if it's not enforced, then you don't have any of that, and you don't have any of the fun of that, or the joy of that, the benefit of seeing these new places and, and meeting new people in real life. So we are committed to that. We've invested a lot in it. It'll be important to all of our games, um, not only Ingress. So we look at it as a long-term investment. So um, it won't be easy. There are lots of smart people out there who you know, want to find a way around it or, you know, Prove that they can do it, and uh, we're just, you know, we're committed to to working on it on our side and keeping it 
keeping it fair. So um, that's what we'll continue to do our best to do. And I will readily admit it's imperfect. I'm sure there are people out there writing their posts right now to tell us where we're missing. And I know that there are situations that we're not 100% on top of at the moment. Um, but that's not to say that work isn't being done and um, that infrastructure isn't there that um, can take care of it. So it is very important to us. One of the other sort of behind the scenes questions that a lot of our viewers have brought up, um, a lot of questions have come up about the portal submission process, um, you know, in terms of, you know, what happens sort of behind the scenes with that and is there any update in terms of, um, you know, the backlog of portals to be sub that are going through the process right now and will portal submissions ever open back up. Anything to share? We would love to know anything about it. <laughs> I mean, so portal finding, portal discovery for me is is at the heart of what we are about. And it was originally a core part of the game. Because Ingress, for us, is about three things. It's about motivating you know people to get exercise and um, move around and go to places. It's about encouraging people to interact with other people in real life. And it's about encouraging people to discover new interesting places in their neighborhoods and cities and the places that they travel. And part of that is originally we had this uh, kind of buzz wordy uh, phrase of to see the world with new eyes. That was kind of written on a lot of our internal documents and so on, just to remind ourselves of what we were trying to do. Meaning to see the stuff that you see all the time, but to stop and see it in a fresh way, and to actually get rid of the autopilot for you know a few seconds, and actually you know be cognizant of what's in front of you, and and take it in and appreciate the thing that you walked by a zillion times and just never stopped to notice before. So you know, looking for portals is a great way to do that because that really means that you are putting your your mind to its full capacity, right? To see what's around you and inspect it and really look for those things that are special and unique and that hopefully other people will find special and unique. And it's, I mean, I, I submitted a large number of the original portals in Ingress in the San Francisco area and in the East Bay and I loved doing that. Uh, for me that was one of the most fun parts of the design process of the game was thinking about what kinds of places ought to be, portals ought to be in the game and then going out and trying to find those and photographing them and lighting them up and seeing other people discover them. Um, so I'm a huge fan of that. Uh, we incorporated it into the game uh, or into Ingress, into the scanner, uh, and um, the SEER badge was created. And, you know, honestly, it was interesting the effect that it had. Um, we wanted to reward people who were prolific portal, portal submitters, uh, but it also uh, seemed to encourage some people to sort of you know, kind of try a shotgun approach of submitting the maximum number of things, hoping that some percentage of them would get approved. Uh, so we got a lot of low-quality submissions, uh, drive-by portals, people driving around the car, just, you know, kind of snapping things out the window. Um, it made it difficult for us to process all of them. Uh, and it really wasn't in the spirit of, of the original intent of the game. So... Uh, you know, everything, I guess that's just a long way of saying that everything kind of worked exactly as we anticipated. There were some surprises. Um, we have gotten an amazing submission set of portals from around the world. It's in the millions. We've had many, many times that submitted. The amount that have been selected are, are a fraction of the total that have, that have been submitted. Um, and I think at this point it's, um, it's an amazing set of places. Uh, and I've traveled quite a bit in Europe and in Asia playing Ingress and I, you know it's led me to just fascinating place after fascinating place that weren't things that weren't in the guidebooks but are amazingly cool in little pocket neighborhoods and in parks and all over the place. Um, but we know that we need to re-engage the community uh, to allow new places to come in because the world isn't static, it's dynamic, it changes, places go away, new places are created. Um, we're committed to doing that. Uh, we are committed to doing it in a way that will involve the community in voting and rating on those things. Um, and when it's ready, we'll debut it for you all. But it is something 
that's actively being worked on, and it will um, it will happen uh, at some point in the not too distant future. Well, um, talking about community, there's a lot of um, agents that after reaching level 16, they're dropping the game. So I, I wonder uh, if you have any strategies in development to continue to retain long-time players or even to bring back retired uh, players to, to pick up the scanner again. Yeah, that's um, that's important to me too. I you know I do hear that um, from experienced players from time to time. It always um, you know it makes it makes my heart hurt a little bit to hear somebody say that. Well, you know they're they're thinking about not playing anymore. Um, of course, if somebody's played the game for for many years and has gotten a lot of value out of it during those years, I'm grateful for that, and I hope I hope they're they've enjoyed that time as well. But I want it to go on forever, so I and I want our um, long-time experienced players to feel happy and energized and motivated to keep playing and to stay engaged. Uh, I mean, you guys, those of you that have been around, everybody on you know in this group for sure, and probably many of the people watching, um, it's just such an amazing community. I don't want it to break up. You know, it's uh, it's like your high school class or whatever. You don't want to. You know, you don't want people to go off in their different directions. <clears throat> so we are looking at um, many things that we can do to keep the game interesting and engaging to add new challenges for the most experienced players out there. Um, we are looking at you know things like additional levels and additional medals. Uh, you know, anomaly structure and rules. You saw us do the flash shards. Um, you've seen the you know, the structure of the anomalies continue to evolve as we get feedback uh, to try to keep those fresh and, uh, you know, present different challenges and utilize, you know, so the players will utilize different strategies and need to, you know, do things differently to keep it fresh and interesting. So it's very important, um, and we will, um, we are working on the things that I mentioned to, uh, yeah, try to put some fresh stuff out there and keep, keep everybody happy about continuing to be part of the community. All right, speaking of keeping everyone happy, um, let's give you a little bit of a break. And um, also just, uh, you know, one of the really important parts of Ingress is the investigation. And so we have got Typhoon Jim from Operation Essex to uh, catch us up. We've been on break for a little while, so catch us up a little bit on some of the developments with the Ingress investigation. So Typhoon Jim, welcome back. Hey, good to be back. So, man, we've had a bit of a break since the last uh, Behind the Scanner episode, but in that time, things have things are coming to a head in Aegis Nova. Now, there's a lot of things at risk in the final iteration of this series. Despite the fact that the Enlightened have done very well, the Resistance have tried to thwart the Acolytes' efforts, they've tried to protect Ada, but it seems like Jarvis has everything he needs. However, it seems also that there's going to be something very important about Tokyo that it may either thwart or change the meaning of the coming attack upon Ada, which we're pretty sure is going to happen. Now, the question is, who will be affected by this? What, what will we see? I mean, we know that Ada is not like a person, where, you know, inside your mind, that's where the, the seed of your personality, yourself. But Ada, her mind, as it is, is spread across the world, is in instances, inside computing clusters, and even it said bits of it in your scanner. Now, We've heard from the Acolyte that the strike that Jarvis intends to use will, I quote, turn the AI against itself. Now, what does that mean? I have a suspicion that this will be perhaps a way of having each of these instances maybe start deciding their own fate. Maybe we'll see disagreements inside Ada. We've already seen signs where Oliver Linton Wolf has reported that Ada forgets things, which is seemingly impossible for an entity such as her. And seems to lose track of things. So the question is, is that when Jarvis attacks, will these instances secede from the greater Ada? But at the same time, doesn't that sound like maybe the birth of a new race? Sort of the a new sort of creatures will inhabit the Earth? Maybe that attack will not go as planned. And I think perhaps what Jahan is able to do or not do in Tokyo, depending on the outcome, will really affect that. Now, another event that is likely to happen in Tokyo is the confrontation between Susanna Moyer and Jahan. We know that Susanna Moyer is on her way to meet up with Jahan to 
perhaps extract revenge, or who knows, for what happened to her father, Nigel Moyer, in Brooklyn. Now, I remember on the last episode we talked about we didn't know whether the body that was dis discovered in the harbor in Brooklyn was Nigel Moyer or not. Well, at this point, we've had confirmation. Sadly, it is. And Susanna Moyer is not happy being an NIA agent. She has something to do about it. So she's bringing the fight to Jahan. Jahan doesn't seem to be taking her seriously, but for the looks of it, Antoine Smith, who her who seems to be serving currently as her assistant, definitely is. So it's going to be quite the confrontation. Okay. It's going to be interesting, definitely, to see the the fallout and what what occurs. You know, uh, Jim, I I think you you share the sentiment in that you know a lot of people think that the anomaly series might be over, but there's there's a lot at stake, like you just mentioned. Um, do you think that? What are your thoughts on Ada specifically? Do you think that she she will fork? Do you think that she could actually die? Can can an AI? Feel fear. So here's here's a, a thing to think about. Now remember back on um, try, I can't exactly remember which numbered episode it was, but we had Ada as a guest, and in fact, while you were questioning her, there was a bit of a problem, and this Slightly. is something of a problem at least. And so we realized at that point that Ada had been attached to what we now call the Nazir substrate. This is the thing that. The, uh, the anti-Magnus has been seeking to advance humanity in their own way. But it is also a place that Ada described that is somewhere she can grow. That it's not unlike the Shaper Ultimate, and perhaps maybe even is the same thing. But in any case, my feeling is, is that Ada, uh, we know that she'd been trying to fortify herself and, and advance her own being. The first way she tried is through gaining mind units and interitus. She wanted copies of human patterns to advance herself. She tried to work with Hank Johnson to get his pattern and perhaps create simulacra. Neither of those efforts were entirely successful. Now we know that she was a, she attempted to connect to the Zero substrate, but was kicked back out in Okinawa. And if you remember the video at the end of the uh, the Abaddon event, where she talked about how she this was a place that she could grow, and this is a place that she felt betrayed by being kicked away from this. So I feel like this next step may indeed be. This might be her last, I guess, her last chance to really evolve. And the question is, what is she going to evolve into? Will she evolve into perhaps a, a collective race, or will she perhaps evolve into a collection of warring personalities that neither have a common goal or a common understanding of the world? So let me ask you one last follow-up question then about um, Jahan and specifically the acolyte, or actually Susanna Moyer. So we know that. Susanna Moyer's father was on boat being interrogated by allegedly Jahan and Jahan's, uh, uh, I forget his right hand man, her right hand man's name. But um, do we know what information she got, if any, out of him? There was something about, I don't know, the, the substrate, some sort of information? Indeed. Now, we know at this point that the Aegis Nova Shield has a dual function, that it is both protective, as we discovered in Obsidian, something it can close off, but it can also become a weapon. That, as we heard before, first the shield, then the sword. Now, the goal that Jahan has had ever since the shield was put into place by the Acolyte was to weaponize it, and she had been searching all around to find a means of doing so, and it was believed that Nigel Moyer might have some information as to how to do this, what might be the next step. Now, the question you have to ask is that, well, she had him in her, under her power, and even I even think that in a lot of ways Nigel Moyer is sympathetic to the goals of the Nazir from what I've heard before. So you've got to ask, what was it that was so dangerous that Nigel Moyer would hold back from someone who I think in other circumstances he might agree with? And I think the answer to this is that when Jahan seeks to weaponize the Aegis Nova Shield, remember that we sealed off the world from the portals at that point. We had a cut the amount of XM that came out of the portals was cut down. Well, if you think about it, what if you took all that XM and directed it at a single target? And I feel like that is the weaponizing of the shield. And so think about the danger that that could pose if XM is ordered information and perhaps even the building blocks of consciousness. What would a weapon that is made of consciousness be and what would its effects be on both the target and those around it? And so perhaps that is what Jahan is trying to do in Tokyo. 
Interesting. I lied. I've got one more follow-up question. <laughs> uh, Lynn, there was an exchange between Oliver Lynn and Wolf and Susanna at the end of the San Diego, or somewhere in the San Diego anomaly, where he basically said, you know, don't do anything stupid. Um, given that Jahan seems to have a proclivity to uh, murder at this point, at least one body count, is there, should Susanna be worried? Absolutely. I think that uh, Susanna, however, knows exactly what she's walking into. I don't know if you remember another interaction she had with, with uh, Oliver Linton Wolf before. I believe it was before 13 Magnus, where they there's a, a video where there, Oliver Linton Wolf is perhaps around his acolytes, shall we say, and the, Susanna Moyer, at the very end of the video, you'll notice she's armed. Oh, yeah. That's, uh, they're in a bar scene or something like that, right? Indeed. Yeah. And so I think that uh, we've... Uh, remember that Susanna Moyer has been an NIA asset for some time. And we... Uh, while the, we've had questions about what exactly the purpose the NIA had in her, one thing we know for sure is that she has a lot of powers. She is XM-infused for certain because her father had done experiments, which we don't know the details of, on her entire family. But at the same time, she's also had extensive training. So I think Jahan should take her a little more seriously. Well, we'll find out what happens in just a couple of weeks. Tokyo's right around the corner, July 16th. So Absolutely. The payoff will be there for those that wait. With that, Daphne, why don't you take it back, back to our regularly scheduled program. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right, sounds good. So, Ingress, one of my favorite things is exploring. And, John, um, what's been one of your favorite discoveries while you've gotten to explore? And remember to unmute yourself. Yeah, I'm just thinking about that. It's a great question. <clears throat> um, I have had, I've been very lucky in having an excuse to go to all these different cities where anomalies happen in order to um, help. But usually I just sort of hang out with players and play and, you know, the rest of my team does all the hard work. So I have, <laughs> it's a very good deal for me. Um, but it's allowed me to see, um, God, just some amazing places. I mean, I, you know, we were talking about the early days and I'm remembering going to Minneapolis early on for the Minotaur Operation there with Joe and I and Ryan Rose, and it started in the um, at the art gallery in downtown Minneapolis. And as we were walking up, we just happened to hit it on a day when they're having street fairs across the city of Minneapolis. So there was a festival of all these local artists and craftspeople in the park across from the starting point of the anomaly, and you just sort of stroll through there on this beautiful sunny morning, and then and then. Um, crossed over to the outdoor sculpture gallery in front of the Walker Museum in Minneapolis, and it was this glorious sunny day, and it was just so amazing to be there at that particular point in time, and it was Ingress that led me there. And then throughout the day, as we were playing, um, I was on a uh, bike, bike share bike that I had rented, so it was this big, heavy bike, and I was trying to keep up with the bike teams, um, the team that I was on, and uh, we were crisscrossing through the city, but uh, street fairs are happening throughout the city on that day, so it's actually kind of hard to get around, but, you know, it was just this amazing festive atmosphere throughout the day. So that was a special one. Um, I remember, I mean, going to Kyoto for the event that we had there was unforgettable. Uh, Kyoto is, I think, I would have to say maybe my favorite city on Earth, and I hope to go there again, actually, next week. Um, I had, uh, we had a chance to meet the mayor when I was there, and we were explaining Ingress to him. He was actually kind of a tech-savvy guy. He came and he actually presented at the after party. He's actually on the recap video. Um, and he's, what he said in his office to me, he repeated the next day. He said, well, I think, I think Kyoto was, was designed for Ingress. Uh, and you know, what he meant was that you know, the city has thousands of years of history and all these amazing historic sites. And Ingress is really the perfect you know, experience to put on top of that because it's a game, but it's, you know, tr you, you see these just amazing places. So we were there. It was cherry blossom uh, season. So throughout Kyoto, the trees were in bloom. During the anomaly day itself, it was a celebratory day. So people were traveling from throughout Japan to be in Kyoto during cherry blossom. And often people wear traditional costumes in Kyoto during that period. So people were there in uh, 
you know, full dress, traditional dress. So kimono and um, the men were in their full robed uh, attire, strolling with umbrellas under these cherry blossoms. And the wind was kind of hit the trees, and the blossoms, you know, would kind of trickle down. And uh, it was this beautiful spring day. And it was amazing um, to just have a chance to see that. And then the day after the anomaly, I uh, left my hotel and took a walk uh, with Ingress uh, with the scanner. And I was just decided I just wanted to go to a temple. I hadn't had a chance to go to a temple uh, during the day before because we had been so busy. And so I just looked for one that seemed like a significant temple. I didn't read anything about it. It was within walking distance of my hotel. So uh, I spent about 20 minutes getting there. And it was this amazing monastery. Uh, it was kind of um, a little bit overcast that day. It was a little bit kind of foggy, as I recall. They were ringing the bells of the monastery, and I was uh, just kind of strolling through and, you know, hacking portals and, you know, doing a little for the enlightened. Um, but it was, it was, it was. Uh, I don't know how to describe it. I mean, it, it was amazing. It was one of the most beautiful kind of places and mornings uh, that I've experienced. I was led on a path behind the actual monastery up into the hill. So there's this path that wound up into this wooded hillside behind the monastery and every so often there was a little shrine <clears throat> beside the pathway so you're kind of going up into this wooded area but it was kind of part of the monastery. I guess it was like a meditation path or something that the monks used and at the top there was this guy playing this like long horn instrument. I don't actually know what it's called but it was this kind of weird spooky music echoing through this canyon and uh, yeah so I um, captured as many portals as I could, and and, uh, and that was that. But it was, yeah, it was fabulous. That was, was yeah, that was probably the tops. Yeah, I mean, just imagining from the descriptions you're sharing, that sounds just truly magical. And yes, I, I mean, I, yep, I, I understand why. <laughs> Um, yeah, I got to get down to Mexico City and see Jorge. I uh, saw some of his crew in San Diego. I was very happy to meet them, and um, got some, we took some photos, and I got some cards, so looking forward to getting down that way. I know there's a lot of really cool uh, stuff, archaeological sites and historical sites in Mexico and in and around Mexico City, so hopefully I'll get down there to see you one of these days. Yeah, we will be happy to have you here, and there's a lot of uh, really cool stuff, and yes, my, my friends were so happy and thrilled, and some other things <laughs> to meet you there and well I have here the, your sign man so oh, yeah so it's it's really cool awesome way to, way to represent <laughs> um, all right so a slight topic change but um, endgame a very popular question I was uh, so what's the current status of that um, I can't say a lot because we want to kind of uh, be organized about such things, but um, suffice to say that um, I've been playing it and I like it. Okay. That is some news I like to hear. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yes, there's, there's going to be some, there's some excited chatter actually happening in the chat room, I think. <laughs> Well, speaking of excited chatter, um, since we're here in the Niantic San Francisco offices, I think we can do this. Why don't we take everybody out of the tube and show them around the office? Cool. <laughs> I, I did want to show off one thing in particular. I posted about this on social that we are doing this bio card wall. And uh, it was sort of... Well, I'd been handed all these bio cards kind of at various times, and they were collected on my desk, and I got a whole bunch from the last time I went to Japan. So I thought, well, we should do this wall. So I posted about it, and then they really started pouring in. So, um, yeah, we put them up, and it's so awesome. So I wanted to show that to you guys. I don't know if there's much else to show you guys that would be interesting, but, yeah, we're in our kind of conference room here. Um, Joe is here with us. And just outside here, this is where everybody works and does their thing. 
And we have some nice light here. We're close to the Bay Bridge. I don't know if you can see out the window. The contrast will work, but the bridge is right up there. And our window's open, so we get a nice breeze. And is this holding up video-wise? Is it working for you guys? Yes, it looks fantastic. Okay. So this is our little kitchen where we eat our meals every day. We have a little table, and we kind of gather around here, and you know all the kind of essentials of life here: uh, granola bars and sweets and chips and that sort of stuff. Uh, we have our TARDIS, which is actually um, hopefully there's some Doctor Who fans out there. Um, this was actually commissioned by a very good friend of mine who I worked with at Google named Chikai Ozama. So he actually had this built, and then he had no place to store it, so he gave it to me for us to have here in our office. Um, and well, that makes sense that he couldn't store it anywhere because it's bigger on the inside, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, yes, and even the outside is a little bit large. <laughs> So there's a little bit of glare, but you'll get a sense of the biocard wall here. So this is, can you guys see that at all? Is it focusing? So that is the beginning of the wall. And Daphne, you are up here somewhere for sure. And it just goes on. How cool. And on. And on. Oh my goodness. And on. I should. I mean, oh my god, it's going to cover the, all the walls. Oh I still got to get and mine on. And on and on and on and on and on. I think so, so crack in there. <laughs> so anyway, it's looking super awesome. So yeah, if any of you guys out there have not seen your bio card, please send it, and we will be very honored to place it upon the wall. That's the tour, Andrew. Over to you, sir. That was quick and sweet. I think uh, Daphne's got a follow-up question for you, though. I'm here. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> here, or Kelly, you want to go ahead and ask it? Yeah, yeah. So, um, John, one thing I've been really wanting to ask you about is Go Rock. And, um, you know, that's been something that I've been really excited about. Um, and I was wondering, you know, can you share your personal experience with Go Rock um, as well as what, what do you hope that other Asians would take away from their own experience? Yeah, I love Gorok. I love the Gorok guys. Um, I read about the company online, um, and uh, I was originally drawn to them because I liked the fact that they were making these really high-quality packs, and they were making them um, in the U.S., and they were you know, paying people a living wage to, to make these things, and they were trying to make these really durable, high-quality items, and um, I just, you know, I thought that was really cool. So I started learning a little bit about the company, um, and then I saw that they had these events, which seemed pretty awesome, and they had these, uh, you know, highly trained, uh, really dedicated folks running them. Uh, so we actually uh, reached out and had them come and do an event for our team uh, in San Francisco. So we had them come in and run an event for us. And Big Daddy was the uh, was the guy who did it. So uh, we had a really good time out on the Embarcadero here in San Francisco, um, walking around barefoot, uh, carrying people around on stretchers and rolling around on the grass. So it was quite an afternoon. Um, it was a ton of fun. So um, really high quality individuals. Jason is awesome. He's so motivating. I loved, loved his, se his session on BTS. Um, he did great. I love the interview you did with Big Daddy in San Diego. Daphne, I thought that went really well. Uh, he is such a such a gifted storyteller, uh, fun guy to hang out with. Um, so yeah, I mean, we <clears throat> started talking about how we could uh, combine the events that they do with ingress events in an interesting way uh, to give people who wanted a more physical challenge something to do, but to make sure that it was part of uh, you know fully part of the anomaly, fully part of ingress at the same time. And you know, we're not experts on planning. Things like that. I'm running, you know, these highly physical kinds of things. So we felt it was, you know, much better than trying to do something like that ourselves to have the real deal. And luckily, they were up for it, and uh, we, you know, tried it as an experiment a couple of times and got a favorable response. And uh, the Gorok uh, group has really been supportive, and they seem to enjoy 
the contact of the community. Um, it's interesting to see the two groups come together because they are, in some ways, two very different uh, groups and do very different cultures. But it, it seems to work. You know, it's uh, I think both parties get something from the other uh, in terms of bringing the, those groups together, and it's been fantastic actually to see. Um, to see, you know, folks who might not normally sign up for something like that and do something like that be intrigued through ingress to give it a shot and go out and do it and just feel so accomplished and happy and proud, you know, at the end of it. Um, it's great to see Max, who's, you know, done several of these events in his chair, do it. Um, I ran into him again down in San Diego. He was at Oakland. Uh, such an inspiration to see uh, Max out there leading the charge. Um, such an awesome guy. So, yeah, we like it. We're, you know, we continue to tweak the, you know, the way that things are structured in terms of how it integrates in to keep things balanced and keep it interesting for everybody. We will continue to tweak it. Um, I did the event in New Orleans, which uh, I thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, the highlight for me, I remember midway through, uh, we had just finished some go ruck stuff and carrying heavy stuff around, and there was just a few minutes left until measurement. And we were probably three quarters of a mile from the cluster that um, that we needed to get to, and so I took off with another uh, person who'd been doing the go rock full sprint by the waterfront in Los Angeles, or in uh, New Orleans rather, just running as fast as I possibly could with 30 round pack on my back and my the scanner in front of me, and I was firing XMPs as we rolled into the portal to, you know, join the battle over, you know, controlling it for those final critical last few minutes. Um, but it was awesome just to have, you know, an excuse or inspiration to, you know, be so physical about it and to really exert myself physically as part of that, but then to also, you know, have that um, fit in with the ingress uh, gameplay. Yeah, I've been telling people Go Ruck is basically like playing at an anomaly turn to 11. Very intense. Yeah, it can be. You know, it doesn't have to be overly intense for people. I mean, the cool thing about it is it's a team event, and it's about everybody finishing. And, you know, what you learn when you do it is that you think it's about some sort of test of your personal strength or whatever, but it's really not. It's about it's a test of your kind of mental strength, and it is and it is a learning exercise, and, you know, you're only as, you're only as good as, you know, getting the last person there. And... Um, it's really about rallying to make sure that everybody's taken care of and everybody finishes, and that's what it's all about. So, um, yes, it is like playing it turned up to 11, but also people shouldn't be intimidated by it. It is it's serious, and you should um, you know prepare a little bit for it. But it's something I think almost anybody who plays Ingress can do, and uh, and it's it, you'll be supported by your teammates, and it's a really great experience. So I would encourage everybody to give it a try who hasn't yet. Well, so speaking of experience, um, I'm going to put you on the spot again, so hopefully you don't get in trouble. But what about virtual reality and that experience? Is there any chance that we're going to incorporate VR into Ingress with, with cardboard or something like that to sort of give missions, portal pictures, more immersion? I don't know. I mean, I kind of, uh, you know, I dissed a VR a little bit earlier. Um, I do think it could be a very compelling thing for people to do. I think a lot of other people are investing a lot of money in creating VR experiences. Um, it probably won't be a focus for us, or I can say definitively it will not be a focus for us. Um, I can't say definitively that we would never do anything in VR. I think there could be some opportunities to do kind of add-on things with it. In fact, uh, there's one that's caught my imagination recently that we've been discussing. We'll see if that comes to fruition or not. Um, so I don't know. All I can give you is a real C on that one. Excellent, excellent. Well, John, sadly, this is the last question of this interview, but it could have some really good answer on it. So are there any outrageous stories or myths you like to dispel this evening? Well, <clears throat> okay. So uh, this one's for Typhoon Jim. There, you know, there have been a lot of rumors about exotic matter and what kind of effect it has on people. And uh, you know, there have been rumors of cover-ups and information being hidden, medical experiments, and so on. And um, 
I just want to say for the record that, <clears throat> for the record, there has been no definitive results from any experiment that XM is harmful to the human body. So I can say that with, uh, with complete conviction. There has been no definitive proof of that, and I just wanted to put that out there. Excellent. We, I, I believe the enlightened faction would uh, strongly agree with that statement. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you guys for having me. It's been a lot of fun. Love the show. Uh, thank you so, so much. I'll be watching. Keep, keep on doing Thanks very your much. good work. All right, and I mean, well, it is, we do have a tradition where, for better or for worse, we do give our guests uh, 60 seconds to talk about whatever they want. Um, you can give a shout out or dispel any more myths or um, anything. So, if there's anything else you'd like to share, please, please feel free to do so. Well, you know, ingress is my favorite topic, so I've been talking about what I wanted to talk about for the past. You know, 45 minutes. So I don't think I have anything else. Uh, but it's been great. Congrats again on reaching 100th episode. And I look forward to the next 100. Thank you all. Thank you. And keeping in line with our summer schedule, um, we will be back in two weeks, everybody. Woohoo! In the meantime, if you know someone who would make a great guest, submit their information to us at BehindTheScanner.com and click on Guest Suggestions. I didn't say that earlier, so I kind of felt like I needed to put that in. Um, as well as, you know, here's a toast to the next 100 episodes of Behind the Scanner. Thanks, everyone, for being part of this very special episode tonight. Woohoo! Ooh, pretty. Oh. <laughs> That's great. Perfect. <laughs> Well, I have this, so, um, oh, well, happy hacking, everyone. Take care, everybody. Thanks for watching. Yay! Hey. Yeah, this is why we should have the fireworks show going on. And, uh, we'll all those leftover fireworks. Yeah, sure. Yes, I know. Well, the two-for-one sales at all those fireworks stands, right? <laughs> Good job, guys. Yeah, thank you. This is great. Go, 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 go.